The Theory of Political Economy by William Stanley Jevons Chapter 5 Theory of Labor Part 9 Various Cases of the Theory As we have now reached the principal question in economics, it will be well to consider the meaning and results of our equations in some detail. It will, in the first place, be apparent that the absolute facility of producing commodities will not determine the character and amount of trade. The ratio of exchange y1 over x1 is not determined by omega1, nor by omega2, separately, but by their comparative magnitudes. If the producing power of a country were doubled, no direct effect would be produced upon the terms of its commerce provided that the increase were equal in all branches of production. This is a point of great importance, which was correctly conceived by Ricardo, and has been fully explained by John Stuart Mill. But though there is no such direct effect, it may happen that there will be an indirect effect through the variation of the degree of utility of different articles. When an increased amount of every commodity can be produced, it is not likely that the increase will be equally desired in each branch of consumption. Hence, the degree of utility will fall in some cases more than in others. The alteration of the ratios of exchange must result then the production of the less needed commodities will not be extended so much as in the case of the more needed ones. We might find in such instances new proofs that value depends not upon labor, but upon the degree of utility. It will also be apparent that nations possessing exactly similar powers of production cannot gain by mutual commerce, and consequently will not have any such commerce, however free from artificial restrictions. We get this result as follows. Taking omega-1 and omega-2, as before, to be the final ratios of productiveness in one country, and mu-1, mu-2, in a second. Then, if the conditions of the production are exactly similar, we have omega-2 over omega-1 equals mu-2 over mu-1. But when a country does not trade at all, its labor and consumption are distributed according to the condition. Phi x over phi y equals omega-2 over omega-1. Now, from these equations, it follows necessarily that phi x over psi y equals mu2 over mu1. That is to say, the production and consumption already conform to the conditions of production of the second country, and will not undergo any alteration when trade with this country becomes possible. This is the doctrine usually stated in the works of political economy, and for which there are good grounds, but I do not think the statement will hold true if the conditions of consumption be very different in two countries. There might be two countries exactly similar in regard to their powers of producing beef and corn, and if their habits of consumption were also exactly similar, there would be no trade in these articles. But suppose that the first country consumed proportionally more beef, and the second more corn. Then, if there were no trade, the powers of the soil would be differently taxed. Then different ratios of exchange would prevail. Freedom of trade could cause an interchange of corn and beef. Thus, I conclude that it is only where habits of consumption as well as the powers of production are alike that trade brings no advantage. The general effect of foreign commerce is to disturb, to the advantage of a country, the mode in which it distributes its labor, excluding from view the cost of carriage and other expenses of commerce. We must always have true Omega 2 over omega 1 equals y1 over x1 equals mu2 over mu1. If, then, omega 2 was originally less in proportion to omega 1, then is in accordance with these equations. Some labor will be transferred from the production of y to that of x until, by the increased magnitude of omega 2 and the lessened magnitude of omega 1, equality is brought about. As in the theory of exchange, so in the theory of production, any of the equations may fail, and the meaning is capable of interpretation. Thus, if the equation omega 2 over omega 1 equals y1 over x1 cannot be established, it is impossible that the production of both commodities y and x can go on. One of them will be produced at an expenditure of labor constantly out of proportion to that at which it may be had by exchange. If we could not, for instance, import oranges from abroad, Part of the labor of the country would probably be diverted from its present employment to raise them, but the cost of production would be always above that of getting them indirectly by exchange, so that free trade necessarily destroys 
such a wasteful branch of industry. It is on this principle that we import the whole of our wines, teas, sugar, coffee, spices, and many other articles from abroad. The ratio of exchange of any two commodities will be determined by a kind of struggle between the conditions of consumption and production, but here again failure of the equations may take place. In the all-important equations, phi x plus x1 over psi y minus y1 equals omega 2 over omega 1 equals y1 over x1. Omega 2 expresses the ease with which we may make additions to y. If we find any means by machinery or otherwise to increasing y without limit, and with the same ease as before, we must in all probability alter the ratio of exchange y1 over x1 in a corresponding degree. But if we could imagine the existence of a large population within reach of the supposed country whose desire to consume the quantity y1 never decreased, how large was the quantity available, then we should never have y1 over x1 equal to omega 2 over omega 1, and the producers of y would make large gains of the nature of rent.